I'm Yolanda um, and this is Speak On. Um, this is Speak On, we need to talk about mental health. We're coming towards the end of our um, online series. We've been running these events since October, exploring lots of different issues around mental health. And this week is all about men's mental health. Um, today, we're talking about the pressure to be buff, body image, eating disorders, exercise disorders, and men, which is something we don't really talk about that much. It's something I don't know that much about um, because it's, I don't know, I've never heard anyone talk about it. I just hear it's so focused on women. So I've got two brilliant people joining me on the panel today. Um, I've, got, I've got Dr. Russell Delderfield um, and I have Lawrence Fountain as well. So guys, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves and say a little bit about yourself. If I start with Russell and then go to Lawrence. Hi there, so as Yolanda said, I'm Dr. Russell Delderfield. I'm a psychologist and I um, study male eating disorders and everything associated with that um, qualitatively using very specific methods. Um, I work at the, uh, the University of Bradford in the north of the UK um, and I've been doing this now for about ooh, 10 years, I think, and have various publications and things if you decide you want to look anything up. Um, other than that, that's enough about me for now. And Lawrence? Um, where do we start? Um, uh, I'm your former uh, trainer. Um, <laughs> I'm a, a body transformation coach. I have a, a gym in East London. I have um, uh, uh, a, a, a deep passion for transformation on, uh, on, on a, a much deeper level. And, and over the, over the last uh, 10 years of, of experience, we've really started to nail down and focus on how can we deliver everything rather than just simply the aesthetics. And a huge part of that comes uh, uh, mental stability or the, the, the idea of can we have the tools to handle life well uh, and respond and react appropriately to whatever life has to throw at us. And, and, um, that's really where my heart's been for uh, a good amount of time now. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and yeah, so Lawrence used to be my trainer. And the reason I invited him on today is when I was uh, training with him, it was at that time when basically lots of people in my life had passed away and I was in not the most amazing mental space. And he was the first personal trainer that actually said, how are you sleeping? What about your sleep? What about what you're eating? What about your emotional health? What about your mental health? And it kind of presented me with way more balance than I'd ever had with any trainer or anything before. And I realized that it wasn't just about like losing weight or anything like that. It was about how I can find that balance and be healthy and happy within myself. So I just thought it'd be, um, yeah, he'd be like a perfect person. And Dr. Russell, I mean, you, yeah, you are basically the expert on this. So we're gonna just pick your brain and find out everything that we can. Okay. Bye, bye. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go to Russell first. Um, is it common for men to have eating disorders? Well, it's commoner than we think. Mm -hmm. um, the, the data that we collect, particularly in the UK, isn't really very coordinated. So we don't have a true picture, if, if we're honest. And I think scientists should be honest about this. The fact is about 9% of recorded cases of presenting and then being treated for an eating disorder are male so we know that and often the figure 10 percent appears in the in the press a bit rounded up so i'm fine with that that's that's reasonable mm -hmm. so that means that if we have about it's really rough but about seven hundred and thirty thousand cases then we're talking you know a small portion of the population in terms of numbers mm -hmm. Uh, that are men have eating disorders, but we're still talking about tens of thousands. So that's an awful lot of men and all of their loved ones, all of their families, all of their social circles and their employers that are all in some way often affected by what the man's going through. That's still a lot of lives, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is there like an, in has there been an increase at all in recent years? Yes and no. So again, I'm going to be brutally honest here. Often when you see a newspaper stories, it tends to be a, that little bit of an edge of creating that buzz and interest to make sure people read the story. So it is often reported we've had an increase and it's even sometimes reported by charities. But there's no evidence of that in terms of how many men are experiencing it. What we've had a massive increase in is men coming forward to get help, support and treatment. 
mm-hmm. but we've not seen any so that we often do kind of studies that are called population studies where we look at people who may have uh, indicators of these types of sy- symptoms these behaviors beliefs practices but it doesn't mean that they're diagnosed with an eating disorder and currently getting treatment or support mm-hmm. they tell us that the the incidence the occurrence of eating disorders is, in men is still quite stable but lots more people have been accessing treatment yeah okay that's good to know that people are starting to come forward and why do you think people, more uh, men are starting to come forward about this I think uh, I have two primary reasons. I think there's a lot more, um, but the two main ones are media does help. So the more we raise awareness of this stuff, the more uh, an individual man might think, okay, so I'm not completely on my own then, or I'm not completely insane, mad, bonkers, not functioning well. You know, all those derogatory words we use to ourselves about ourselves. And so then that sometimes stimulates someone to go, I think I should maybe talk to someone about this. This is, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing these behaviors. I'm in these obsessions. I'm stuck in this cycle and I can't break it. And it's damaging my emotional health and my social life. Um, And the other one is, I think, um, so this is a bold thing I'm saying here, but I feel okay saying it because of the stuff I research because I do qualitative psychology. I think masculinity, as a construct that women experience of men and men experience individually and together is changing not quick enough or deep enough some might say but it is more likely that we've got more men who don't think it's as um big a statement to make about what kind of man they are if they just go and get some help it's not a weakness or a shortcoming or it's not even admitting to some terrible personal failing I I think some of those attitudes are gradually being chipped away at and that's why we see more men thinking oh no I can get help this is actually okay I can talk to someone about it yeah brilliant and Lawrence do you see um like people that may come like approach you for training have you noticed any like disordered eating or anything with potential clients um I wouldn't say I'd I'd have a dramatic uh, influx of clients with um, eating disorders, so to speak of, mm-hmm. potential unhealthy relationships with their emotions and, uh, you know, emotions driving their food choices. So technically you could call that, uh, you know, a, a disorder of their eating habits. Um, but, you know, I, I, I generally find even though there is that freedom of expression when men, for me, when men feel that they are down on their look, their escapism methods are more likely to be alcohol and drugs and um i find that's a, a bigger expanse of 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 men these days of how they are coping but but they're, they're all they're all um very interlinked and sometimes the most subtle of eating disorders even the sporad uh, even sporadically missing meals say across the day because we are stressed or working or busy leads to that uh, build-up of uh, pressure and, and stress and, and and then you know utilizing these escapism methods so of, of course it's everything is deep rooted back to food and you know we, we see this uh, pattern of recovery when eating habits are put into place and i think um it, it's difficult for me because I feel like I'm probably not the sort of character men would be more open with uh, and maybe try and be a little bit more macho around. But there's certainly um, some guys that I've, I've dealt with recently that um, have followed certain plans like Weight Watchers, which is, uh, which in my opinion is, is openly an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then what kind of, symptoms should people look out for in themselves or others i'll go to russell first well i think if you if we follow on what lawrence is saying then it's about whether or not um food has become a significant issue the way we treat food how we um what position we give it in our lives how we use it it's the difference between um self-nutrition self-nutritive acts around food 
and a pleasurable act around food, you know, eating with family, eating with people you love, and then getting to places where food takes on a different meaning and represents something else when we are using food. Or obviously the other one, not using food, you know, so that instead of excess or um, rigidity and ritual, we're in the restriction area of things. So food might be an obvious one for some people. Interestingly, culturally, I think it's more obvious when women's eating patterns change than men's. But I mean, maybe that's something we would come back to because that's enormous. Anyway, the other symptoms are about whether or not a man is beginning to change other aspects of his life to fit around his body project and to fit around um, the kind of diet regime he might be on and whether or not that's becoming all encompassing. Now I'm, I'm saying, I'm adding something extra here, which is this is not about really committed, committing to an exercise and a fitness and health plan and then doing the adjustments it needs to incorporate that into your life. That's different. We're talking about people who slowly but surely give up doing things with other people that don't in, involve their um, exercise and diet regime of choice. So you start to lose social and emotional connectedness because this becomes your driving thing. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we typically think of that associated with women are slightly true. You know that sudden changes in weight can be an indicator, sudden losses of appetite, you know, going from being a, a regular eater to really apparently on the surface of it, not eating at all, even when it's socially, um, where there's kind of a social injunction against not eating, such as eating with others. Um, so some of those things you might find in women, um, female eating disorders, or even if we're not talking disordered eating, but things like eating distress, um, eating disruption, you can say that they are true for some men, depending on which way they're leaning towards kind of um, excess, ritualising or restriction. Yeah, thank you. And over to Lawrence. So with alongside talking about eating disorders today, we're also talking about kind of, I suppose, exercise, compulsive exercise disorder or kind of, I suppose, excessive working out. Is this something that you've seen? And if it's something you see, what do you what do you do about it as a trainer? I am. Um, this is actually my biggest concern with uh the modern world right now is that they are lacking context when it comes to exercise. We live in this society where more is better. Uh, if you're not dying, if you're not got the blood, sweat and tears on the floor, then you haven't earned the ability to, you know, uh, call yourself, um, you know, a, fit, uh, a fitness fanatic or a fitness addict. And we use all these like, uh, uh, slurs like that you know if we were to put them into uh into connection with other um other words that it would be grotesque you know to call someone so, an addict um wouldn't be a healthy way to speak to someone but we've grown this culture where uh everything's intense 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 all the time um and and people have lost the idea that we are still human even though we are as a whole a little bit healthier and a bit more aware of fitness as um, a prerogative to a, a better way and a healthy way of life when you have no context to understand that the impact of that exercise is another key stimulus alongside work alongside the stress of a bad relationship alongside junk food alongside poor sleep and you put all that into this big m melting pot of, um, of 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 stress and stimulus and, and people wonder why we, we live in a society just punishing uh, punished by anxiety depression and i think it's it, it's it's a consequence of of only ever portraying how much hard work you're doing for a lot of people and not portraying the fact that you know these so i can go to bed <laughs> at seven o'clock this time of night is my bedtime but that's not the sexy bit that's not the cool bit that's not what's going to get me likes on instagram they want to see the big lifts the train training hard and i just think there's this pattern now of you know, even health professionals, fitness professionals, they're the worst. Like if you speak to them, they've all got chronic anxiety, depression, body issues, confidence issues. And it all comes from this 
uh, overstimulus and, and having that poor psychology from uh, um, poor quality sleep that sort of uh, creates a, a, neg a slightly more negative subconscious. We know it's ne inherently negative anyway, mm -hmm. but then you really, uh, if you go into bed hyped and pumped up all up with adrenaline flowing through the body and, and, and that's how your body's having to, to rest throughout the night, you know, being heavily stimulated by the release of continuous glucose into the brain, then of course you're on, on this constant uh, sympathetic train where the body just uh, has no has no opportunity to sort of uh, come back to its natural homeostatic set point where we can really utilize food properly. Mm -hmm. And so people are just missing the whole point is like this no days off uh go hard or go home it actually stops you from absorbing the food that you need to be healthy and happy and to sleep well and to feel good and to have this beautiful self-perception of yourself where you can be confident in your own body because all that changes when you know nutrient deficiency is in play because you're addicted to the uh, you know the the stimulus and the cortisol release and of uh, of exercise and you know you can probably hear from <laughs> how passionate I am about this that this this is a, a real concern we're no longer living in a generation of of lazy people but people who are heavily addicted mm -hmm. to stress and stimulus and that can't switch off that would rather not switch off uh, and, and keep connected in some way to some sort of um, so to some sort of stimulus, whether that's social media, uh, exercise, um, hard dieting, it, it's, it's all very, uh, it all seems to become very addictive. Yeah. And you made so many good points in there, because if you think about um, one of the things I was going to ask as well, is like, where, where do you think this is coming from in terms of like, I suppose, uh, men's increased interest in exercising a really specific way and kind of having a really specific body or physique or whatever else where do you think that comes from i know you touched on social media there and i think you've the the main point that really kind of stood out for me is that there seems to be um this kind of focus towards hard work hard work hard work and constantly if you're not working you're not doing anything at all kind of mentality which we see across fitness which you see across kind of work across loads of different things like i follow people that own businesses and they're like team no sleep and it's like why wouldn't you want to go to sleep um so yeah so do you what where do you think that kind of drive comes from for um for men to ha have that kind of body that they're seeking mm, I, th I think those um those without it seem to think that their happiness may increase should they get to a certain point with their physique. Um, and I can tell you from experience, it absolutely does not. Um, so there's that constant drive to, you know, it's part, it's part of society, part of our rat race. There's that constant drive to get ahead because mm -hmm. if you're ahead, you're happier. But unfortunately that's, that's not true. Uh, and, and we've become detached from, the the opportunity to just be present with oneself rather than always constantly thinking about how we need to progress and how we need to move forward with our careers and our physiques mm -hmm. and um where has it come from um maybe um beautiful lighting on instagram you know the mm -hmm. fact that anyone uh, you know steroid use uh, the fact that um you know uh, I, I i think like you know personally from experience i've done the the um the photo shoots the fitness photo shoots and i don't look like that. <laughs> i don't know like that in real life it's just the way it is um and but you can be easily be led to believe that that standard is is normal so that can, you know you can almost feel like oh i'm not enough mm -hmm. i'm not enough the way they are but the truth is that person probably only looked like that for a day worked for almost uh, 20 to 30 weeks eating very little and, and got that way and but because of what we betray on social media because we do it with smiles and we only show the good and we never show the anxiety and the fact that you, you slept for two hours a night and woke up four times in that period that um that they, they think that that's um 
it's a, a, a nice place, a, a beautiful process. So standards have, ch have, have, have changed. Um, and Russell, what do you think there? Because I saw you nodding emphatically. Oh, oh, no. oh gosh, try and stop me. I will try and rein myself in. So, <laughs> Lawrence is absolutely right. Standards have changed. There's a big, our bodies are not, um, we want people, we are desperate for people, certainly in the West, to believe that the individual is everything. You know, you're in control of your destiny. This is all down to you. Um, I mean, things like the American dream are built on that, the way that our constitution is unwritten, the way we commodify the flesh and blood that is the human body. And if you put that in, if you lump that in with everything else, you know, the, the issues that have got us here with men are the same as an eating disorder, which is they're all multifactorial. There's, all, there's more than one thing in play. But the thing that strikes me the most is the more that we present this idea that um, our bodies are not functional and certainly settling for them being functional is not good enough and that we uh, should be doing something with them and if we're not, we're not worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't live long, we're not worthy and, and blaming people around lifestyle choices making something like obesity into a lifestyle choice mm -hmm. as if it were like a decision to pick up smoking when most people know that what leads people to obesity it cannot sometimes and often involve some personal choice but it doesn't boil down to that at all mm -hmm. so what i want to throw in the mix is this whole thing around um well two things really the adonis complex that was kind of investigated about 20 years ago now and has kind of stayed which which charted this change in the um the way that men were expressing themselves and discovering that they were valued for an aesthetic as much as women formerly had been for centuries mm -hmm. now, it's a bit of a myth to say that men were never valued for an aesthetic they were always valued for their money power ardent displays of masculinity ability to provide ability to protect you know all that kind of historic masculinity stuff mm -hmm. there have been periods in history where men's aesthetic where their look their ability to display themselves like peacocks and perfect peacocks have been really entrenched in a culture and we're slightly we're cycling back around to this to some degree so the kind of tyranny that governed women's bodies for years that mm -hmm. so many thousands, if not millions of women have worked to break free from, you know, I'm more than what you perceive when you look at me. Mm -hmm. I am more than an object of um, sexual desire or uh, an example of fertility. Mm -hmm. um, some of that tyranny is being visited upon, is being visited upon men and we're all kind of colluding with it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all investing in it the people are lapping it up you know love island is well, that's new that isn't something outdated from the 1960s where people were put practically naked on display for mm -hmm. our titillation and amusement and for us to pass comments on which one you fancy the most or mm -hmm. who's doing what to whom so there's this i this adonis complex idea is very interesting and as lawrence has said it a lot of men have translated this into very specific ways of doing exercise or focusing on, I mean, to the fact where you can do body workouts that focus on different body parts or today's leg day, today's chest day. It's like fetishizing bits of a man's body, fetishizing your own body. Now, I'm not saying I'm not a trainer. I, you know, there's probably very legitimate reasons for a man building that in and breaking that down to hit his goals. But when really we're talking about how a body looks because the man isn't going to set foot out the gym and try lifting a truck off a poor old pensioner laid in the middle of the road who's been run over you know if they don't need the strength for functionality mm -hmm. if something else is driving that if in the background there's a cocktail of all sorts of self-worth and self-esteem things going on then it it is kind of human nature to drive those those terrors and those fears into something and currently it's plowing into a lot of men's bodies Mm -hmm. So there's one more thing I'll say about it, and I promise I'll, I'll hand over. <laughs> so there's a really good example of this, which is, I mean, I collect this stuff, my data analysis, but oh, goodness, it drives me nuts. The dad bod. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
putting someone like Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth under a long lens camera playing on a beach, normally a private beach, with his family in between Marvel Universe films. And then the whole article is about how he's let himself go. And that's exactly what Lawrence is saying. No, that's relaxed muscle under a, just a normal human amount of subcutaneous tissue because he isn't on a regime where he works and works and works, bulks, cuts and shreds, and then dehydrates himself for three days because he's about to do a near naked scene on a on a screen mm. and and the fact that we've now got to a man's re a functional healthy the man goes surfing he does all sorts of activities with his kids that is a healthy functional man's body and now we're calling that a dad bod and shaming him for it mm. and he's just what i pluck that name out of the air i've seen i've got so many of them yeah and it's just it really I mean, how are, how are regular men meant to live up to that, yeah. you know? Because it's wild, we, isn't it? Yeah, we're tricking men just like we tricked women for years that the only desirable body was this one. And if there's even a tiny ounce of fat, if it looks like there could be a ripple over a waistband, then you're not worthy. And mm -hmm. now we're doing it to men. And we know for a fact that these people in the public eye work under very expert professional help to get to the place where they are ready to be on camera, but we're passing it off as if it's normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's like, you made so many good points there because it's genuinely the scrutiny that women have been under for such a long time. So when yeah. I saw that, I was like, well, this just seems, this, this, is, this is like the same song, just slightly different melody. Yeah. That's li literally what it is. And I, can't, and I wonder, like, Lawrence, do you see, have you seen like people kind of, not react to that necessarily, but do you think that's got like a, that's a huge contributing factor? And do you see a lot of guys self-worth um, like attached to how they look and kind of see any like psychological effects from that? And is that something you have to kind of counter with your more positive kind of training regime? I, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of, my opinion is, is slightly different in the sense that the, the actually the, the, a lot of guys that I, work with find more self-worth in the rest of their lives when they utilize a certain lifestyle to get into better shape mm -hmm. obviously it can be abused uh, and it can become a point of um just an unnecessary feeding of ego mm -hmm. but at the, at the same time um you talked about previously like lifting weights that you never need to it's um the the sort of the um, stimulus and, and uh, um, emotional drive that you get that from uh, doing those exercises and the stability that you get mentally um, by conquering something on a day-to-day -day basis I think actually fundamentally if done right can be um, supporting the self-image and, and, and mental stability of men around the globe and and so it's it's where the line is drawn, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure because I think there is a lot, a small amount of pressure to be healthier, happier, eat better, sleep more, and the, the aesthetics be a byproduct of those things is essentially something that every man should really think about in investing time, money, and effort into themselves. But in terms of feeling the pressure to look a certain way, is there is it a double-edged sword? Potentially, yes. Could it work in both directions? Potentially, yes. So could that little bit of pressure to look a certain way actually make this guy feel quietly a lot more calm and confident and, and uh, uh, more masculine in his presence? Yeah, maybe. I, I, th I think it's, I think it's um, something that needs to be considered case by case and something that needs to be um, thought about more the intention behind the actions rather than um, the I'm not good enough, I need to change rather than I'm, I'm worth every bit of time and effort um, to put into being a better person. And, and sh sometimes the, the muscular physique comes uh, as a side effect and a byproduct of 
care and attention and love to yourself. Yeah. So it's a real complex subject of you know where that where that line gets drawn and and, and how much pressure to be healthy is healthy. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting because it, it on kind of the. Uh, within I suppose where women are with body image we still have a long way to go because things like bloody daily mail and their sidebar of nonsense still exists where every woman is putting on if you're standing there you're putting on a busty display purely because you're a woman standing there with tits but then you know or you know how dare she wear that or like every everything is about being on display none of it is just about existing or being in a film or living your life and they're starting to do that to men more and more yeah. but where I think where some of the female body positive movement is going is where we're talking about body neutrality being happy that your body that your body functions the way it does and like you were saying like both of you said really looking after it in a way that makes you happy that is about you being healthy, having balance. And if it changes as a result of that, it changes as a result of that kind of thing. But it's about just being happy with just being like kind of praising your body and loving yourself in a really specific way, regardless of maybe how that looks. Um, so, yes, I think that's maybe I don't know. I hope that we can shift that over to both like to well to all genders as well. Um, so how can people start approaching so if anyone has recognized any of these things in themselves or in others let's we'll start with actually in them with people recognizing it in themselves how can people start approaching exercise and like and eating in a healthy way if they feel like something is disordered i'll go to russell first um well even if it's not disordered if you think things have moved to a different place for you that yeah and it, and it often not always you can't promise that in psychology but often you can tell that something shifted and maybe is less healthy or less useful or less self-nurturing than it was before mm -hmm. um one of the things that i tell people is about whether or not what you're saying or doing to yourself with your own body your own diet your own regime whether that's something you would put on someone else let's say your yeah young son or your best mate who's going through a bad time or you know someone you actually care about and think a lot of is that something you would be making them do now in the pursuit of let's say a, a change of lifestyle or a fitness goal I mean one of the things that I find quite inspiring about what Lawrence is saying is that idea that if if all of our health and fitness industry strove to be holistic well, you never just, it's never just about physiological fitness and function. It's absolutely about your whole experience of living your life and your well-being and where you want to get to. Because one, not everyone who goes to a gym and works hard at that has a disorder. That's really important. That's certainly not true of every man. But two, the other thing is that you can, you can also still have goals, health goals, but they may not be bodily focused in the sense of material fitness. And I think if you're having conversations with yourself that are becoming punitive or moving, you know, Lawrence was talking about that stress, that anxiety. If you find those little self messages are kind of shifting from being about being better at work, being better, being a better dad, being a better person at home, being a better person for your mates, whatever that might be for you. And it's now turning on to what you're putting in your body, when you're putting it in your body, whether you can adjust that and, and if it all starts getting a bit negative speak mm -hmm. and it's it's about you failing and uh, you know aren't you crap you haven't done this and you said you would do this today and you promised you were going to do this and cut that and go to this if once it begins to turn negative you, need, you really need to start thinking about well, what if i if that was someone else and whom i loved and esteemed is that the way i treat them and talk to them because if not then i really need to have a think about the way i'm treating myself mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, Lawrence? The question was, how would you identify? Oh, so how can you like start approaching that? If you've identified that something is, is maybe happening or disordered or stressed or kind of just a little bit wrong, um, how can you um, approach exercise and, and like fitness and eating in a healthier way? It's, 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 a, a, for, for me, the way I would always start with someone is, is by changing their... The, the the root habits is so nothing that's too pressured mm -hmm. something that results in 
a greater yield of happiness as a result of something simple that remains unthought about, something that doesn't necessarily, can be um, tracked, but not necessarily scrupulously measured. So, you know, um, you know, their hydration and the fact they're getting enough vegetables and, uh, you know, the protein sources and, and the fact that 90% of the diet's whole foods, I think, like we have this intuition that we know, we, uh, we know what to eat, uh, what, what the right foods are to eat. And obviously that intuition is overridden by uh, the influence of stress. And, and, and we should really identify, okay, what's the reason why I chose this food? Do I choose this food because I want it? Or was it a, uh, about short-term gratification? Was there any sort of long-term happiness that I was going to gain or, or um, nutritional content that I was going to gain from that that will really help me handle life a little bit better? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's being conscious of, of why you're eating certain things, um, whether that is causing damage to your mental health, your physical health, and asking yourself, do you have, um, do you need help? <laughs> um, because that's, that's uh, something that's uh, in abundance in, in this day and age, is uh, that the fact that if it doesn't feel quite right, there are a lot of resources to, to say, you know, maybe we could try this. And it's really okay to experiment with different ways of eating. You know, there are a million different ways to be healthy. Um, but I think intuitively, we know when things are, are slightly going wrong. We know we just, we ch as, as humans, we choose good food when we feel happy. Mm. And, you know, very rarely will someone cook a, like a burger and chips at home. I just don't see that anyone who prepares their own food tends to bore, tends to go into this uh, a healthier option. And I think moving towards a more ritual style of eating where, like we talked about before, there is time away from the world with loved ones. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a key indicator that you're not getting things right. If there's not that uh, celebration of food and celebration of eating, uh, if there's not time spent with loved ones and bonding over food, then then you can be sure that you've probably lost your way. And that would be the first steps for me is mm -hmm. designated time for you to mm -hmm. enjoy food. And um, that's a, there's, those are really basic principles of, of where to start. The, the, the details are less, less important. You know, when we talk about calorie control and macronutrient control, the way the body processes food and utilizes its nutrients is how calm we are when we sit, when we, we uh, slow down, we shift into that parasympathetic state, digestion starts to flow, or the uh, stomach acid starts to get released and we can just utilize it properly. But that takes, con like being conscious of the fact that we do need to, be grateful <laughs> for the fact that we're even having this opportunity to sit down and eat and just slow the fuck down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we were putting this together, we actually had quite a few like questions and which is kind of what I've um, been going through here. But one of the main questions we had, um, because there are a few people that are booked in to watch this back, is what can people do if they spot this in their loved ones? So we've had some people that may have spotted in their children, in their partners, in their friends. What should people do if they're like, okay, I think that there's something, something is like, it's off here. Um, I'll go to Russell first. How can people approach this without, I suppose, I don't know, frightening people or pushing people away? Yeah. There's a really, uh, well, I hope it's good. Um, it's mine. There's a chapter in a, in a colleague's book, Lynn Crilly's book called Hope with Eating Disorders. And it's a chapter just about men and boys. And there's some advice in there of kind of approaches to, to take. I mean, literally things to maybe say or things to avoid saying or where you can get safe information from that's accurate. Mm -hmm. The main thing is, it is really to let the man know that you are up for talking about something uh, if he wants to, without necessarily putting a name on it. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, as we've been saying in this, it, it may be the man 
might want to talk to you about some of the other things going on in his life, even if what you've done is spotted some behaviours around his body, his exercise, his diet. Um, be open to that. I feel as if if you just let the, the bloke know that they can say something to you about anything that's on their mind, they're more likely to then continue by saying, and I'm a bit worried this has got a bit out of control, or I feel like I knew what I was doing with this, um, you know, diet package I, I'm, I'm on that I've subscribed to that I meet up with once a week and now I feel like I'm losing my way with it. You, they're more likely to get to that place if you let them know that you've spotted, you think something might be amiss, that things are not quite okay with them and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is from experience and from kind of empirical research. I think you have to have a certain sort of relationship with a man or, or a young man to be able to kind of say to them, I'm really worried that you've developed some problems around food or mm -hmm. around your, your fitness and your, your body stuff. That's, there's got to be a certain strength of a relationship there before you would automatically be that direct. But I'm saying it because I'm not ruling it out. Mm -hmm. you, you could, if you have enough of a relationship and things do feel that obvious, Sometimes, I'm being really careful how I say this, sometimes these things can leak a little bit around the edges mm -hmm. to the point where um, all genders can use the same strategies um, to kind of get, see if someone will notice. They're not always conscious. You're not, you're not consciously saying, I'll just skip this meal and make a big deal about it, or I'll skip this meal and be absolutely steadfast in my refusal to to eat properly or you know and that's a slightly glib um, example but but sometimes we do leak things and that might be because a bit of our brain saying to us somebody noticed that I'm not doing so well because mm -hmm. I don't know how to just say it out loud so um yeah that I'll, I'll stop there but that's what I would say brilliant and um Lawrence if somebody is, spots it and I suppose I don't know have you ever spotted it in a client where you're like I think that or someone that you may know um, that you think was maybe over exercising or compulsively exercising. Uh, what did you say, or what would you suggest someone would say, um, should say if they've seen that? Mm. Well, it, it may be slightly different from what I would say to um, how they would approach it. I would approach it by breaking down the sort of uh, biochemical processes to make them understand that actually this isn't a healthy process in which they're involved in, and, and the maybe some of the symptoms and feelings and, and thoughts that they're having right now are connected to these issues and explain, explain how they translate. But I think if a, a partner was to uh, see these symptoms, I think, you know, that, you know, the, the, the key is always communication is like, let them aware, let them know that you're aware that there may be an issue. Do not pressure them to be different but lead by example. So if, if someone's particularly overeating, for example, it might just be a case of getting them involved with uh, cooking a beautiful, healthy meal, or just making sure that, um, this is so, so, so complex. <laughs> it's just so complex. It's like, where, where do you begin? Uh, love, uh, love, show someone some love. Um, you never know uh, where the root cause of is of that eating disorder. Mm -hmm. and um support and an ear uh, can can go a long way to solve every every issue um every issue i think that's on the planet yeah and you're trying to be kind you're aiming for kindness but you and you don't want to be manipulative in any way but i also think so we know for instance tentatively that we think about 40 percent of recorded reported binge eating disorder cases are male rather than female so it's much more prevalent in men well partners and family members often begin to notice because food they thought they were going to kind of eat and share together has vanished at some point that nobody noticed yeah you know, it's just gone and it won't be a bit of it it'll be all of it yeah. um and those things you know um a lot of eating disorders males and men and women don't really like using the male and female thing as a noun so men and women boys and girls who end up with these issues um they're really good secret keepers particularly of their own and often others secrets and so you know trying to get secrets out of them their own private stuff is, can sometimes feel like 
wringing something out of the stone. But, you know, being able to, it really is what Lawrence was saying. If, if you're saying, oh, I was really looking forward to eating X with you when we sat down for dinner this weekend, can you find it? I can't, I can't see it. You know, mm -hmm. we got that together when we were out shopping, didn't we? Sometimes small things like that can be enough for, some, for a, a guy to say, oh, well, I've been doing that a lot lately. I, I, you know, you've gone to bed and I just sit up and I... I eat, I eat anything I can put my hands on or, you know, so I can't promise it'll work. But those small bits of communication, but done in a kind way, you know, showing that it's because you were looking forward to sharing food with them or sharing time with them is a lot better than kind of um, breaking a confession by getting them to admit that all of this stuff for the kids' birthday dinner has vanished somewhere between 12 and 2 a.m. So I, um, I would go with that, yeah, that kindness and making it about shared experience together and and why that might be changing or why you might want to get that back those can sometimes work better to approach somebody oh, brilliant thank you change the environment as well i think i think it, you know a lot of these disorders come from stress within a certain environment and if you take someone away from that for a certain amount of time you know just you know away for a weekend in the countryside it, that can really be a game changer in terms of like the pressure's off, I, I don't need to compensate with food or I don't need to be hard on myself. I can let go a little bit here. There is just me and you. I, I think, um, you know, just de-stressing in general is a, is a fantastic way to say, I, I hear you. Um, and, um, you know, this, this something needed to change this week because the the taking away that stimulus can often be a trigger to realize that they were stressed in the first place mm -hmm. because it's stress is often like being drunk. It's like when you're in it, you feel uh, you're completely unaware of it. And a lot of the time uh, you just, you, you're productive and busy or actually not. <laughs> and uh, you just running around like a headless tricking without mental clarity, without mental focus from uh, the confusion of all that, cortisol related, released in the brain. So I think, uh, you know, it's a really nice tactic is just take someone into a, a nice stress-free environment, uh, like we talked about in go away to the countryside and, and see how someone responds. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, we've had a question in, um, what are some things to look out for if I'm concerned? So this is someone that's, that's wants to look out for someone, I don't know if it's a friend or family or whatever else, what kind of indicators should they be looking for i'm not sure uh, if this is for eating or for fitness but if i go to you first russell for eating then i'll go to lawrence for fitness if you can just go over what those things are so um changes in um shared habits around food reluctance to be involved in anything to do with food whereas maybe formerly they would see friends for meals or you know cook meals for people at home or be involved in that kind of thing anything where you begin to spot they might be being a bit shamed and a bit secret around either avoiding eating food in front of somebody else or um trying to cover up instances where they've clearly been enjoying food with others or you know um, entirely on their own um again i know i've already said it but changes in weight that feel drastic so obviously in both men and women, anorexia is often the most reported, most treated thing. But that's because if someone is uh, really in their anorexia, it becomes increasingly obvious to loved ones, to mm -hmm. people around them. But that can go the other way. You know, if someone's had a very kind of steady weight and suddenly they're gaining weight, but you, you see them all the time and they've not, had occasion to eat anything extra there's loads of reasons why that might be but again that could be one and look for negative talk around themselves or uh, around food and eating and calories and diet and and working with men it might be more about compensatory stuff so doing something about calories they will consume or have consumed those little bits of language if they begin to change and you think oh you you were never that bothered about that before. I wonder what's sparking that. Now, obviously, it's the same thing, isn't it? We're not suggesting if these things are present, somebody's got a disorder. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Lawrence has already said it, so I won't go over it. There's loads more going on in the background that turns it into something or, you know, that becomes a real pathological problem. But yeah, those are indicators. Uh, the other thing I would say is if you want kind of a little bit of a comprehensive list, mm -hmm. I'd encourage you to go to the BEAT website. Yeah. Um, because that, that really does cover lots of things to look for. Don't forget about the stuff that does feature a lot in the media as well. So, um, I know it's unpleasant to think about, but there are instances of bulimia in men. Mm -hmm. You know, that idea of trying to cover up vomiting, things like that, mm -hmm. that you might not be sure of because they're not going to do those things in front of you, but you might you might feel that you can tell those things. Um, normally, it's a collective of small things when it comes to food. Okay, brilliant. And then, Lawrence, do you have any to add uh, for exercise? So if I was to feel like someone um, I was aware was over-exercising. What kind of things should people be looking out for? Um, injuries, lack of sleep um, are key indicators that the, the, the body isn't uh, in a position to, um, to exercise. Anxiety, depression, um, using, using uh, exercise to... Um, relieve guilt from bad food is probably the, the most unhealthy cycle that uh, most uh, uh, most common in women. Um, feeling like they have to earn food is, uh, is a real big um, key warning sign. Um, I, get, I guess, you know, how you would approach that is just like, you know, can they, can they, um, I'm trying to think of the word I'm trying to think of. Um, can they rationalize what they're doing? You know, is it, is it, do they understand that it's healthy? Do they understand that, you know, do, do professionals train that way? Is, is it normal to train every day? These are the questions that you want to, you want to ask yourself, um, you know, what's your intention behind exercise? Uh, you know, how hard are you? Are you okay? And, and actually, you know, one of the biggest things is if someone can't take a rest, rest, yeah. that's a, a, a big warning sign. So that fear and anxiety around slowing or stopping for the, for the sake of not making some progress or putting on weight. Um, yeah, that would be a, a, a really big sign that there is, um, is out of balance. The other thing I've found as well in the literature, so we're talking about scientific literature, it kind of adds to what Lawrence has said is, men do weigh themselves inevitably, you know, there are, there are places to be weighed in, in fitness areas and leisure centres and stuff, and you might have scales and things at home, but there's some slight evidence that, you know, if you discover that a man in your life is suddenly measuring body parts, like circumferences of legs, calves, biceps, and, and, um, like doing it really often so we're not talking about doing it after they've done a period of work and they were working on something that they were committed to and now they want to see if there's some results so we're talking about this obsession we get where we think something will have changed overnight and that it won't be to do with what's gone in our bodies or what we've done and fluid you know fluid retention things like that um that somehow it'll be about you know that we've just instantly built muscle overnight and now I should be able to see you know a 0.2 of a centimeter or whatever um that it sounds a bit trite but that does feature in some of the literature you know this obsessive measuring um so maybe that might be another indicator less around food and more about around exercise yeah. I, I would say mood is is probably a, a key one so mood effect being affected by uh, the numbers on the scale or the measurements mm -hmm. overriding their objective uh, feelings so okay hold on a minute ago you were saying you were healthier happier you were feeling more vibrant more charismatic and then you jump on the scales and now you're miserable yeah. that, that that's the that's when it become, has become um, um you become disconnected with what mm -hmm. that, that scale number really means mm -hmm. because really it, it, it could mean a thousand different things yeah. those understand how how the body uh, is influenced by different stimulus and factors sodium uh, hydration sleep stress uh, will know that those numbers will fluctuate hugely so it's it's 
if, if you see someone whose happiness and um, uh, so-called success depends on the continuous uh, dropping of, of a scale number, then I would say that that, that you need to um, carefully approach that um, and make them aware that it's 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 possibly not the healthiest way to um, assess whether you're really making progress because those subjective measurements are really important. The fact that you can digest food for the first time, the fact that you've you've not wake woken up three times in the night to to go to the loo, you know, all these these things that 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 really can enhance your life, and then to be uh, to all that to be diminished by the fact that you're. 0.3 kilos or is, is a good sign that um you you may need to stray back onto the the right path um and just uh, i've got one more question well, a few more sorry two more questions um so the first one is uh how do you let someone know that over exercising for guilty eating is an eating disorder so you brought that up actually in one of your in one of the things we were saying things to look out for so how could someone let someone know that that might be an issue so we call it the guilt, the guilt cycle, uh, and it, it would play out um, around. The, 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 physiologically, it's very destructive. So um, because the, the, both the food and the exercise put you in, a, in an inflammatory state. So like, you know, you, over, you, you overeat, uh, you over then you overtrain, you don't process that food properly, you become heavily inflamed, you then compensate by not eating at all or eating a lot less. That's another stimulus in general and that drives down to eventual uh, a break in your um, diet again, where you would then binge eat and then train harder. How do you make someone aware of that? Well, you first have to be aware that the, most of the the calories that you utilize in the day and not from exercise at all. It's, it's actually a very small percent. And um, if people realize that they could, you know, the majority of their, the, the fat that they're going to utilize depends on the quality of their sleep. So, you know, are, um, is the body in uh, a chronic sympathetic dominant state where the body will choose to, to chew through um, muscle tissue rather than fat it's it's about education it's 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 really about like supporting the idea that the body needs this a balanced state so you know i think if there was more education on the nervous system that, that you know understanding that we need to have this sympathetic uh, parasympathetic state this rest and digest and this sympathetic is good this fight or flight response is good in a small amount but we need both elements to cause adaptation. They can't be, they can't be changed without that return to, to this homeostatic set point. And um, I've, I've just tried to jack a little bit. <laughs> you know, the, 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 um, the training should be, uh, should be constant, no matter whether you've fallen off track with your diet or not. There shouldn't be more volume of training just because you've eaten more. Yeah. It's a simple case of, okay, you made a mistake, you can make a slight calorie adjustment the next day, but the training is, it was, should never be about the calories burnt anyway. It should always be about, uh, you know, uh, movement and uh, stimulating the uh, increase of, of lean mass so that we can grow old gracefully, so that we can be robust in our old age. Mm -hmm so that we are protected from falls and um, um, knocks and bumps. You know, the, 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 the skeletal structure and, and, uh, and the muscles are, are, are so beautiful and they're, in, and they're in insurance policy as well. Uh, you know, if you, then you're in hospital for, and you can't eat for a certain amount of time, that muscle tissue is gonna be, you know, gonna be, uh, be utilized in providing your organs with all the amino acids that they need. Mm -hmm. So when we think about exercise, we really have to stop thinking about burning off food or burning off calories altogether. That's where, you know, a nice balanced diet comes in. And I think what people don't seem to realize is that because just because you're in a calorie deficit doesn't mean that those calories are coming from fat. Yeah. That depends on how, 
uh, the, the current state of your nervous system, the current state of your mineral profile, your amino acid profile, those are really key to think about when, uh, you, you know, we're burning fat because I think one of the most dangerous things is also is, is probably like the Apple watch mm -hmm. and that need that get up, do exercise. Okay. Get up, do exercise. Okay. And it's daily. And it's, it never turns around and says, you know what, you've worked hard this week. Why don't you chill out for a little bit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and everyone's like comparing, oh, like, you know, I've just done 20,000 20, calories. But where, where the hell did those calories come from? Yeah. So not all body fat. You're certainly not going to aesthetically be better uh, mm -hmm. for driving yourself into the ground. And going back to the original point of how do you, stop this cycle of, of, of guilt it's just people are looking for a benefit from it and if they understood that the, the, the benefit was in just being more consistent and not so hard on themselves and not being so extreme with the ups and the downs the body responds beautifully to, to balance and um, you know even if you want to work super hard in the gym uh, and, and want to, you know, really go um, a hell for leather, you know, the, the, the biggest professionals out there, they'll spend the next, you know, couple of hours or, or two uh, or the evening really relaxing and winding and, and having that key yin time to, um, to approach things. And I think that really helps you control appetite and um, those binge eating thing binge eating anyway so having that complement of the yin and the yang is a really nice way to help someone with the binge eating is to to say maybe give them a different option of exercise is always good yeah i think that was great because then what you've explained in there as well was actually the effect of overtraining everything else which a lot of people i think just don't really know so i suppose one of those main things that that per, that per, if someone has recognized it in someone else is actually saying well actually almost like finding that online and showing them that yeah. showing them this is what it does this is what this is what can happen to you and like you're saying it's about balance like looking after your body for looking after your body's sake looking after your body because it's the one you live in as well um so we've got our, our last question so just have a uh, short answers because i know that it's way past lawrence's bedtime um <laughs> right so i'll go to russell for this um someone asked uh what is what's the view, your view on you can't out exercise a bad diet and what is the panelists opinion on the eat well plate i don't know what the eat well plate is but um so yeah so the first one you can't out exercise a bad diet well i'll i'll answer the second one actually and i'll mm -hmm. hand to lawrence for the first one this uh, out exercising a bad diet the eat well plate mm -hmm. nothing wrong with it very very useful tool in terms of um easy to access nutritional um, visual information so if you're prone to not really have an idea about portion sizes if you've been brought up in a house like I was in the northeast where you know if you don't eat the same portions as your dad then you're not eating as a growing boy then it can be really good for that kind of psychoeducation for some people mm -hmm. if it's being used as the outer limit of a portion to put in one's body right, well, here's the eat well plate and I'm going to eat half of what's on there and I'm going to skip the nice orangey yellow bit that has carbohydrates on it. At the same time as doing, I don't know, an incredibly physical role or job, uh, at the same time as um, being trapped in a cycle of excessive and obsessive exercise, then, then yeah, it can create a visual distortion. We hang on to it, we become obsessed by it. But as just a basic tool for helping people get a grip on portions, and it's exactly what was being said earlier, it's that idea of you going, right, well, I know, I now know what a balanced meals portion roughly looks like, um, but we're having a barbecue today, so I don't, I don't care that most of this is going to be burgers mm. and buns. I've actually never seen the Eat Well plate before, I've just Googled it. And have have you. It's yeah. a real, the NHS, um, forgive me anyone who's from the NHS and goodness knows don't come for me, but the NHS currently love it. Yeah. So um, it's slightly fallen out of it. I think it's had its day a little bit, but it persists and it persists in um, diet and lifestyle groups and so on. And you can buy them online, you can buy them really easy. 
Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I've just looked it up as well because I didn't know what it was either. I'd never seen that before in my life. <laughs> um, and for uh, for Lawrence, um, what is your view on you can't out exercise a bad diet? One hundred percent right. One hundred percent right. You um, look like we just talked about that. The exercise is inflammatory in nature. The bad diet is in, is inflammatory in nature. Both of those things are going to drive that sympathetic response. That's not how to get fit. <laughs> Uh, that's not where the magic happens. The magic actually happens in that homeostatic set point or, uh, you know, homeostasis in the center where we become calm and relaxed. And that's when, you know, we, burn, we create more muscle tissue. We, you know, utilize fat for energy. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a deadly game to literally a deadly game because inflammation is the, the silent killer. So if you're constantly in a position where we are overstimulated, under, under, have a, a, a compromised ability to digest food because of the stimulus of exercise followed by um, poor food anyway that food sits and rots in your gut and it affects the microbiome it affects the way that you think and you feel it affects your ability to produce neurotransmitters it affects your happiness your confidence your well-being everything that you can possibly think of so to say that that's the wrong way to go is um an understatement it's it's it, it, it's compromising uh you as a person and your opportunities in life in every shape and form because you will not uh you, you, you will not have um, you know, the, the, the process in place through the, the different sleep cycles because of too high inflammation that you can sort out and sift through shit <laughs> and, and rectify the problems of the day. You know, what did that look mean? You know, those subconscious uh, fears that we, we are on board all the time. Sleep is where we sort that all out. And if you're in an inflammatory state because you're training hard and eating bad to, uh, and, and training hard to compensate, wow, it's just a cycle of um, dis destruction to possibly, you know, the number one cause for uh, a lot of anxiety that we're facing right now is the fact that you can't earn bad food. You just have to enjoy it. Bad food is amazing. No, just accept the fact that you want it. It's not good for you. Keep it in proportion and, uh, a, a, and get back on with a normal, healthy exercise regime. Um, don't. <laughs> is the short answer don't do it yeah. All right, and thank you so much thank you to everyone that attended in the chat section i've just added some links of uh, where you can follow lawrence where you can follow russell um and you can check out their sites as well for more information and anything else that you need to ask hit us up on instagram um, instagram.com forward slash speak on with an underscore at the end tomorrow is the last session of our series um, and it's going to be a panel discussion that i won't be taking part in because it's going to be for the guys um, and it's talking about the crisis of masculinity um, and its effect on mental health um, so if you'd like to uh, check that out go over to our instagram and um, we'll be sharing the link to it and you can find out all the information or where to register online and we'll be sharing the zoom link tomorrow but anyway thank you so much and thank you so much lawrence for staying with us past your bedtime and oh. thank you russell for joining us with the spotlight on you you look great <laughs> thank you <laughs> Brilliant and have a great night everyone and yeah go to uh, any of our social channels and uh, anything you need to know ask us okay bye thank you bye good night <laughs>